They left Puerto Rico in World War II. Uh, he had not served in the war because he had a serious heart condition, and that meant that he was not eligible to be uh, in the service during the war. She did serve in the war, though. She joined the Women's Army Corps. Uh, they stationed her in Georgia. Her name was Selena. Uh, she spoke English. Her husband was named Juan. He did not speak English. He also only had a third grade education. But together, as a young couple, a uh, very handsome young couple, I think they're adorable in these pictures, I have to say, uh, they moved to New York. They moved to New York during World War II. Uh, they found an apartment in a housing project in the East Bronx. And then in 1954, five weeks after Brown versus Board of Education was decided, uh, five weeks after the Supreme Court struck down the racial segregation of American schools and that landmark decision, five weeks after that, in June 1954, when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, um, they had their first child. They had a baby girl, 1954. Three years later, they had baby number two. They had a little boy uh, who they also named Juan after his father. And the family spoke Spanish at home because Dad only spoke Spanish, he didn't speak English. Dad worked at a tool and dye shop in the Bronx. Uh, Selena, she worked as a phone operator at a hospital in the Bronx. And when their oldest child, their little girl, was eight years old, uh, she was diagnosed with diabetes. They learned that she would need lifelong insulin injections in order to manage her diabetes. And then the following year, when their little girl was nine years old and their little boy was six years old, their father died. Uh, Juan was only 42 years old when he died. He left Selena widowed with these two small kids to raise in the Bronx. And she started working six days a week. She redoubled her efforts to get her kids fully fluent in English, even though they had grown up in a Spanish-speaking home with a monolingual dad. Uh, she, she had been working as a phone operator at that local hospital in the Bronx, but she put herself in school as well, she got her licensed practical nurse certification and she moved up to a better job that paid better. She got a job as a nurse at a methadone clinic in the Bronx and she raised her kids. She saved enough and finagled enough to get her kids into good Catholic schools. She saved enough for the extravagant purchase of a complete set of encyclopedias, which they kept in their apartment. People who grew up with them in that housing project in the Bronx say uh, Selena and her kids were famous for those encyclopedias. And she'd have the kids do their homework with her every night sitting at the kitchen table all together. And uh, their dad didn't live to see it because he died when they were just little kids, but that little boy went on to be a big success. He became a doctor, a successful doctor. Uh, and their little girl, she, she did okay too. She went to this big Catholic high school in the Bronx, 2,000 kids, she was valedictorian. She ended up going from that high school to Princeton University. She said she was intimidated uh, when she first got there. It took her a while to get her bearings, but that definitely wore off. While she was there, she did volunteer work too. She traveled from Princeton to Trenton, New Jersey to help the Spanish-speaking patients who were at the state psychiatric hospital at Trenton. She did that on top of her schoolwork. Maybe because of that initial nervousness at Princeton, her grades started off a little shaky in her first year, but she soon got her bearings and their grades took off like a rocket. By senior year, she was Phi Beta Kappa, and she won the school's highest academic award. She went from Princeton to Yale Law School, passed the bar, became a federal prosecutor. She then became a rather fearsome litigator in private practice. And, and she told people that when she'd been a little kid growing up with a single mom in that housing project in the Bronx, she had gotten herself addicted to Nancy Drew, to the Nancy Drew books. Uh, she read all of the Nancy Drew books and they made her want to be a police detective. Uh, later though, she said that evolved because after reading the Nancy Drew books, she stumbled onto Perry Mason on TV. And watching Perry Mason on TV made her not want to be a police detective anymore. It made her want to be a judge because even though Perry Mason was the star, she could tell clearly the judge was the most important person on that show in terms of who got to make the decisions. And ultimately, that is what happened to her. After being raised in the Bronx by a single widowed mother, speaking English as a second language, working her tail off and making the absolute most of every opportunity she ever got and every institution she ever had any access to, she got there. And in May 2009, a brand new president chose her to be his first nominee to the United States Supreme Court. 
and she bore some insults and some sneering about her perceived intelligence from uh, people in conservative media and uh, from some Republicans in the Senate. She bore some insult along the way, but ultimately they confirmed her nomination, 68 to 31 votes. And in August 2009, Sonia Sotomayor was sworn in and became the first Hispanic person to ever serve on the United States Supreme Court. President Barack Obama should have been able to make three Supreme Court appointments during his time in office because three Supreme Court vacancies arose during his term. But Republicans blocked him from making his final appointment. He was only able to name two justices to the highest court in the land while he was president. He named Elena Kagan and he named Sonia Sotomayor. And they are the third and fourth women to ever serve as Supreme Court justices in our country. And Sonia Sotomayor is the first Latina. In President Obama's two terms in office, he also named the most diverse cabinet that has ever served the United States government. Today, on the last full day of the Obama administration, we learned that the cabinet nominations for the incoming administration are now complete with the announcement that former Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue will be the choice to be the new agriculture secretary. With that announcement, we know that we are about to get the first cabinet since the 1980s that doesn't have a single person in it who is Latino. They have not announced a single Latino for any of the cabinet positions. They have not announced a single Latino for any of the sub-cabinet jobs that they've announced either. Under President Obama, the high school graduation rate in this country hit 83%. That's the highest it has ever been in the history of this country. When President Obama took office in 2009, the country was in an economic freefall plunging into an economic abyss. Unemployment hit 10%. Unemployment is now at 4.7%. Under President Obama, we have had 82 straight months of private sector job growth. That is the longest streak ever in the history of our country of consecutive months in, with there, in which there have been uh, job growth and not job losses. Under President Obama, we put a rover on Mars. Under President Obama, we have had the first drop in the federal prison population in decades. Under President Obama, after a concerted effort by his administration, homelessness among American veterans dropped by half. Under President Obama, 16 countries around the globe gave up every last ounce of their highly enriched uranium, taking away the risk that it could be stolen or misused to assemble the core of a nuclear weapon or to make a dirty bomb. President Obama convened biannual nuclear security summits for the first time in our country to convince other nations to get rid of their loose nuclear material, and 16 of, that, 16 of them did that completely. Under President Obama, your credit card company is no longer allowed to raise your interest rate without notifying you. Under President Obama, if you work for a federal contractor, that company that you work for can no longer fire you just because you're gay or trans. Under President Obama, our country's dependence on foreign oil plummeted. Today, on the last day of the Obama administration, the CIA published the final update to its uh, online document file that it calls Bin Laden's Bookshelf. It's images and translations of all the documents that they took out of Bin Laden's compound in Pakistan when Navy SEALs we're able to go through it all in 2011. We all now have public access to the complete contents of bin Laden's bookshelf because President Obama in 2011 ordered the Navy SEALs into Pakistan on that mission that killed bin Laden. Under President Obama, we got our nation's first chief technology officer. Under a deal engineered by President Obama, Syria got rid of its chemical weapons. For everything else wrong in Syria, Bashar al-Assad had a huge chemical weapons arsenal. Under Barack Obama, it was handed over and destroyed, certified destroyed by international observers. Under President Obama, the US government banned torture by US personnel in all circumstances. Under President Obama, a US embassy opened in Cuba. We started to normalize relations between our two countries after a half century of a frozen, failed Cold War standoff. President Obama overturned the ban on scientific research using stem cells. President Obama upped by billions of dollars the resources available for mental health care in the VA. 
The Obama administration was the first administration ever to voluntarily release the lists of people who visited the White House. First presidency to ever do that. On marriage equality, President Obama did a miraculous thing among politicians. He changed his mind. And under this president, gay couples finally got all the same options as straight couples. You can date, you can get married, you can get divorced, you can live in sin. No more excuses, you guys. Under this president, the FDA started regulating tobacco, which means that cigarette companies, for the first time, have to actually tell you what they put in their cigarettes. When President Obama took office, the deficit was about 10% of our GDP. It is now about 3% of our GDP. Under President Obama, banks have to face stress tests so they can no longer take the whole economy down with them when they collapse because of their own risky practices. Under President Obama, banks can no longer use your money that you deposit in that bank to make risky bets for their own profits. After 9-11, the previous administration built a government registry that targeted Muslim men. Under President Obama, that registry was scrapped amid fears that the next administration might re-up it. President Obama cracked down on the scam for-profit colleges that happily took the money that you borrowed with your student loans, but then didn't give you an education in exchange for that money. The Obama administration shut down the bullpucky accreditor that said those colleges were real colleges when they were not. Under President Obama, solitary confinement was banned for juveniles serving time in federal prison. Under President Obama, our secret overseas prisons got shut down. Under the previous administration, when the remains of U.S. service members were flown home in flag-draped caskets to the air base at Dover, that was a secret and there were no cameras allowed. Under President Obama, that secrecy order was undone. And now, under President Obama, the government will pay travel expenses for the families of fallen soldiers to be there when their loved ones remain, when their loved ones remains arrive on that tarmac. Under President Obama, the don't ask, don't tell ban was repealed in the military, as was the ban on transgender soldiers serving openly. And all combat positions were open to women. President Obama, arguably, saved Medicare. He made Medicare solvent for years to come because he slowed down the growth of health care costs. That is what was eating that program. President Obama also, inarguably, saved the US auto industry. He saved the U.S. auto industry and reorganized GM. They paid back their bailout money, and American automakers are now among the largest, most profitable car companies in the world, and millions of American jobs tell that tale. Tens of billions of dollars that used to get paid to the banks for writing student loan programs instead now go to Pell Grants to help people go to college who otherwise couldn't afford it. Oh, and you can't be denied health insurance because of a pre-existing condition. And you can't be charged more for your health insurance because you're a woman. And your health insurance can't put a lifetime cap on what you're allowed to need because of your health care. And 20 million Americans got health insurance because of President Obama. And for the first time ever, the number of uninsured people in our country is in single digits. More than 90% of the country has health insurance now. And quietly along the way, yes, he did appoint the most diverse cabinet ever. And he appointed a record number of women judges and minority judges, and they will stay there after he is gone, including the first Latina Supreme Court justice, daughter of Selena and Juan, who came from Puerto Rico. And so this is the last day of President Obama's two terms in office. He's being replaced by someone who said that President Obama was secretly foreign, not really American, fake, unqualified to be president. The incoming president called President Obama stupid, called him a disaster. He also fought to have a federal judge removed from a fraud case against him on the sheer basis of the fact that the judge was Latino. He's a Mexican, he said. He's a Mexican, as if that was self-explanatory as to why that judge should not be allowed to hear his case. Everybody who supported the things that President Obama was able to accomplish during his two terms in office now, overnight, moves into a different position as American citizens. 
and, and in this part of your life. I mean, if you like what President Obama was able to do in his eight years in office, all those things that I just mentioned, this is the part of your life now where you will become somebody who doesn't support those things. You will become someone who defends those things. Because the incoming president and what we're about to experience tomorrow, that does reflect the continuous peaceful transfer of power in our country, as we have had for more than two centuries, right? But also, at almost every level, it indicates a reversal and ultimately an attack on everything that the outgoing president has stood for and has embodied over these last eight years. And they will try to undo everything they can. But they can't undo everything. The judges, for example, the judges stay. And the record stays. And the supporters of our nation's first African-American president, the people who give him a 60% approval rating in this country right now as he leaves office, supporters of Barack Obama, they also stay. They also continue to be among us. That is still our country. That is still the people of this country. But if you appreciate what I think is the extraordinary record of President Obama uh, as he leaves office tomorrow, you do now have a new job as a citizen. It's called defense. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.